If you're joining us via the Zoom platform, we are so glad that you are here with us uh, in Zoom. And for those of you joining us on Facebook Live, hello, welcome. We are so excited to have you. My name is Lakeland Hogan. I'm gerontologist and caregiver advocate at Home Instead Senior Care. And I am joined today by Lori LeBay from Alzheimer's Speaks. We are so excited to have you, Lori. Hello. Say hello Hi. to everyone if you would. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm thrilled to be here. So thank you for inviting me. This is, this is going to be a lot of fun. Yes, I am looking forward to it. Um, we'll further introduce Lori in just a little bit, but we wanted to give you all a few minutes to join us via Facebook Live or join us on the Zoom platform. Uh, we want you to know uh, that we are here to provide education and to answer questions today. So uh, we encourage you to ask your questions. We had lots of great questions coming on Facebook all within about the last hour. We were just going through all of those questions. There's so many good ones out there. Uh, as family caregivers, sometimes it can be very overwhelming. And so, um, you know, we want to know your questions and we'll do the best we can to get to as many of them as we can today on Facebook Live uh, or via the Zoom platform as we uh, go through this Facebook uh, Live chat today. So again, if you're just joining us, uh, give us a thumbs up on Facebook, a like, uh, let us know where are you coming from. Even if you're with us on Zoom, there's a chat box. Uh, there's also a Q&A box. We want to know, are you joining us from California, uh, Nebraska? I know I'm in Omaha. Uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Lori, where are you coming from today? I'm in uh, St. Paul, Minneapolis in, Min in uh, Minnesota. So it's very nice. So we're kind of spanning the, um, the continent here with these Facebook chats uh, and these uh, Zoom uh, webinars. So we are really excited again that you are all here with us. It looks like we have people from Texas, Indianapolis, Indiana, Lexington, Kentucky. Um, so thank you all for joining in and for um, letting us know that you're with us today. We're again, very excited to have you. We're gonna get started here in just a few minutes. Uh, but before we do, I just, I'm gonna go over a couple little housekeeping items. Um, again, you're joining us for our caregiver chats uh, brought to you by Home Instead Senior Care. We're a network of franchise offices across the United States providing in-home care and support for those living with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias and for older adults uh, in general. So again, very glad for you to have us join or join us here today. Uh, again, my name is Lakeland Hogan. I'm with Home Instead Senior Care. I'm being joined by Lori LeBay of Alzheimer's Speaks. Uh, we're going to introduce Lori here in just a few minutes. But if you're joining us on Facebook, we want you to comment your questions in uh, below in the comments box. You can also tag people. Um, so if you know of somebody who is also a family caregiver or care partner uh, who you think would benefit from today's chat, please um, type up the at symbol in the comments below and then type their name and it'll send them a notification on Facebook so that they can join us. Uh, we'll also record this webinar for those on Facebook and for those on Zoom and send it back out. Uh, and so we, uh, we have the opportunity to share this, this recording with those who maybe can't join us. Or if, you, if we get to a, a question and you think, wow, uh, my loved one or family member or friend was just asking about that topic, you can forward that recording on so they can get this rich information as well. Um, and then we are muting your lines if you are joining us via Zoom, so we can't hear your background noise. That's just um, helpful for you and for us, reduce that background noise and allowing you to go about your day um, as you listen to our chat. And if you're joining us on Zoom and have a question, you can type them in at any time in the chat box or in the Q&A box. You can find both of those at the bottom of your screen. All right, so it does look like we have someone joining from Massachusetts, uh, Southern California, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, lots of people and some questions are already coming in to us, which is awesome. So we encourage you to ask those questions throughout today. We're going to go through a little bit of an introduction um, and then we'll get to your questions just as soon as we can, but feel free to type them in at any time. Um, and there's no such thing as a silly question. We're a community that's here to support you uh, and want to answer your questions to the best of our ability. So again, very excited for you to have us. 
or have have you join us pardon me um all right so today's topic uh, we are actually hosting this chat on the longest day which uh, is June 21st, obviously, that's today's date, and it's the day with the most light. And so the Alzheimer's Association on a national level has kind of captured this day as a day where they're raising awareness and funds for Alzheimer's disease and other uh, types of dementia. Uh, they're also bringing light to the, the uh, fact that caregiving can be challenging, but the great thing um, about today is we are bringing you hope uh, and tips and resources. While the challenges might exist, there are resources and support out there for you as family caregivers, and so that is our goal today is to share that information with you. So uh, without further ado, again, Lori, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Lori um, is a family caregiver. She provided care uh, to her mother who had Alzheimer's disease, which she's going to tell us a little bit more about here. But she's also turned her experience into advocacy, uh, and she's just very well known and respected in the Alzheimer's community. I am very honored to have her with us. The work she does with Alzheimer's Speak is incredible. So with that, Lori, would you mind just um, sharing a little bit about your caregiving journey with your mom and then how you have uh, then taken that and kind of uh, grown your advocacy work and, and started your organization? We would love to hear that from you. Well, my mom has been gone now for five years, but she lived with the disease for 30. And even back then, you know, we didn't know what Alzheimer's was. We didn't know what dementia was. There were very limited services. And what I, what I tell people when I go out and speak and train now is, is really, and I, I truly believe this, that her disease was the biggest gift I'll ever receive in my life. She taught me such beautiful life lessons about being patient and letting go of control and being more spontaneous and, and more attentive to nonverbal signs and, and feeling comfortable in silence instead of always having to fill in gaps. And so she really was the driver of me switching from a career that I adored for 25 years in residential real estate, never thought I would leave it. And two weeks after I stepped out, it was like I was never there. That's how much I love what I'm doing. But I really felt the need to connect people to resources, products and tools and to raise everyone's voice not just the professionals, because we don't have all the answers, but the people diagnose their families, this is where we learn. And I think to empower family uh, care partners and those living with the diagnosis is so critically important because they know it inside and out, they breathe it, they know what is needed, what's working, what's not, and those, those stories need to be shared. And so that's what we try to do on, on Alzheimer Speaks is to give people platforms um, to tell their stories and to improve the world because we are much stronger together than we are apart. Lori, that is incredible. Um, I think that, the, again, the work you're doing is, is um, so meaningful and, and you're right. Uh, caregivers are living this every day and sometimes you can feel so isolated and alone so having uh, you know platforms like this where we can share the resources and get people connected is, is really can be life-changing for a caregiver who might feel you know extremely iso isolated um, so I know that we're talking about kind of the the challenges of caregiving um, you know, there's a, that roller coaster of emotions. Every day can be different from one day to the next. But I'm wondering, um, since you've kind of lived it and you've had a little time to reflect, uh, what kinds of things um, would you say uh, you you wish you would have known sooner or done differently? I, I don't want to say, you know, tips or advice. I, I like how you, you and I have talked about this earlier, uh, reframing your perspective on, on caregiving. Um, you know, what... What kinds of things do you wish you would have known or um, uh, wish you would have kind of reframed your brain to think differently about um, as you went through that journey with your mom? Well, I think the first thing is, you know, I bought into the fear, the fear of the disease that is pushed so often to raise funds. And instead of, of really holding on to our relationship, knowing that every relationship you're in throughout your life is going to ebb and flow. And just because somebody gets diagnosed with the disease, that's just another turn. But it doesn't have to take away your relationship. So I think, um, I think that for me was really important. And then to 
believe that that there is still communication. You know, people would ask me, I'll, I'll give you this as an example. People would ask me if my mom still knows me. And I found that they asked for two different reasons. One group really wanted to know how we were doing. The other group was so uncomfortable with Alzheimer's disease and dementia in the caregiving journey, they wanted to give me permission to never go see her again. And so mm -hmm. education, being connected and helping people remove the fear. Everybody's dealing with something in their life. Um, another thing would be um, realizing the commonalities instead of focusing on the differences. Mm -hmm. um, realizing what they're still able to do instead of focusing on the losses. So, so much of, of what she taught me really in this journey and what I've learned from so many is really about changing my mindset to improve my heart set and really be centered in this relationship-based care that it's a two-way street, that she still has things to, to give me and share with me and fill me. And sometimes we, we get brought into this belief that that's not possible. And there are so many great possibilities and so many side roads that you're going to go down that sometimes we hold on tight to our routines and we, we, don't, we don't embrace the detours. And all of us have been on a detour that's gone, wow, that was really cool. I didn't know that existed before, that that could happen. And so really walking alongside supporting someone and just saying, you know, neither of us knows what's going to happen. We're just going to do the best we can with the knowledge we have in the moment that we've got. And, and then releasing that guilt, because I think we all beat ourselves up way too much that I could have done better. I could have been nicer. I was a little sharp or I should have done this differently. Knowing that you always have an opportunity to improve next time and then to build on that to share, share your mistakes, share, share your regrets, don't be embarrassed by them, but help teach others what you've learned. You know, this is, life is about, is about adjustments and, and dementia is just another ad adjustment in our life. I really like how you, um, you know, share those tips and I think it can be very overwhelming, um, as you mentioned, but, uh, you know, really, um, realizing that, as you just said, you know, uh, there's, there's that fear, but also there's, there is some good that comes with Alzheimer's. You've talked, you just talked about that in, in your story about your mom and how that um, really ended up being, uh, becoming a passion of yours and then turning that into something where you can help others. Uh, and I think that's kind of co the cool thing about our, you know, Facebook group and these, these caregiver chats is we get a lot of caregivers whose loved one has passed on, but they continue to follow us and engage with us because of that, that sharing of knowledge and, and that supporting of one another, which can be you know, so helpful uh, to those who are living, living through it in the moment. Um, I know that you have created this kind of neat tool, uh, a couple of neat tools, um, one of which is called the memory chip. And I'm going to put a PowerPoint slide up right now. We're not going to do much with PowerPoint today, but I did want to just share that resource and have you just speak to it a little bit if you wouldn't mind, Marie, because I think it's, uh, it's really neat. So would you mind sharing? I think it's up there on the screen now. I think everyone can see it. Yeah, I, I created this because I wasn't the gracious daughter my mom deserved. And there were times when, like everyone else, I snapped. And she would repeat herself 45 times in 10 minutes, and I couldn't make a game of it. I didn't want to make a game of it. I had other stuff to do. And I, I remember one day just feeling really bad, really, and just a horrible daughter. And I think we all go through those moments. But it's about taking those moments and, and making change. What can you do different? And so I really, I, I, I prayed on it. I thought about it a lot. And I thought, what are the three things that are, are really most important? And the first one is, what do I want her to know? And I, as a family member, I want her to know that she is loved, that I love her deeply. Um, but this tool can also be used for professionals. And so from a professional stand, typically we want them to know that we are there to support them, to, to help them, to guide them, um, and, and to be in relationship with them. But our words aren't enough. 
we have to really learn to use our multi-sensory engagement. So that's tone of voice. How do we approach? Do we touch? Are we wearing a cologne? All of those things help them remember who we are because they're reaching out to different pockets in terms of recognition. And again, keep in mind, it's not about what we do, it's about how we make them feel. So how do we make them feel comfortable besides just saying words? Because words might not be processed by them. So all of those things are really important. Um, so with me, I would, I would enter and exit um, any meeting with my mom, if it was in person, um, on video, if it was um, on the phone, and I would kind of have the same saying going in and going out. And at the end, I'd say, see you later, alligator. And, and some people would judge that and say, well, that's, that's childlike. And, I, and to that, I say, you know what? Everybody's different. My mom's gone back in time. This makes her happy. Um, she's content. She's smiling. So it's okay. So know that every person is different and there's not a right or wrong. It's all about keeping them comfortable and, and making them feel safe. The second was, what do I need to focus on? And this is where I really screwed up. And I interviewed people all around the world at all different levels and said, okay, tell me, what are you focusing on? And I felt really good because everybody had a checklist. Everybody had a list of what they needed to do. And this list was all tasks regarding their person with dementia. And, and I was like, okay, I got this down. So I was feeling good. And then a couple months later, I woke up literally in a cold sweat. And I thought, oh my gosh, how did I miss this? And what I missed was this subtle twang in everyone's voice. It didn't have a word, but it was just kind of that tone and texture of, of their verbiage that said, this isn't how I pictured my life. And I thought, oh man, I, I have to not focus on these tasks because as a care partner, you know, we take this seriously. We want to do a good job. We know everyone's hovering over, watching us, making sure we're doing a good job. We want to be, you know, we, we want to, you know, give them what they've given us. Um, we want to live up to everyone's expectations, our own included. But what I realized was really what, what I needed to focus on wasn't the task. It was, was she safe, was she happy, and was she pain-free? And when I focused on those three things, I did my task differently. I was able to breathe and sit next to her on the couch and just hold her hand and maybe sit in silence. I was able to release some of those tasks and realize someone else could step in that I didn't have to be the end all be all, that everybody brings something to the relationship and, is, and it might not meet my standards or be the way I would do it, but you know what? The rest of my life doesn't run like that either. And you know, diversity is, is just a wonderful thing in life. And we have to allow everyone to bring their diversity, their relationship style to that individual and not take them away, take that, take that away from them. And then the last thing was, what do I want to remember? And I found so many care partners were so worried that they weren't going to remember the person who was. Well, none of us are who we used to be. Look in the mirror. You know, most of us have aged. We've been married and divorced and in and out of relationships and jobs and moved. And life, life is all about adjustment. But we can capture moments of joy. And again, I think we are... We are taught to focus on what is lost. And when you can change that mindset of what makes them happy, you know, when they're happy and content, you can breathe. When they're anxious and frustrated or sad, um, you know, we mirror that back and we're trying to fix that. So we have to really learn to appreciate those moments. And maybe what made somebody happy and content before isn't what what it is today and that's okay that's okay but just note it take a picture make a recording um so that you don't have to worry about not remembering and and that is one thing i, I know in my own personal life i was so busy being busy because i liked putting that check mark by things that that was empowering to me especially with a disease that doesn't have a cure and we don't know what's going on I could get empowered by moments of joy, moments of peace, moments of quiet. 
And when you can get to that space, Oh, I, I, there was this turning point for me and uh, my friends started calling me the calm one. How are you the calm one? And it's like, because that's where I want to live. That's, that's what I want to bring. That's what I want to bring to others. And so a lot of it is about shifting our attitude to one of gratitude and, and really embracing our relationships. If it's a family, a friend, or, or if it's a professional relationship, getting to know them and, and letting them know you. Because also many times I found that we, that they're perfectly content until we walk in the room all wired. And then they mirror our attitude back and we have our Stepford wife smile on thinking, they don't know, I'm nervous and I got all this stuff to do, but they're reading all of our body language. That doesn't go away. And so then now they're anxious and now we call now we call them out on a behavior when they were fine before we walked into the room. They are just mirroring back what they're seeing. So know that all of your nonverbals along with your voice um, will be picked up and analyzed by a person with dementia. And they many times will mirror back what it is we are projecting. It's a long answer there, but that's, that's really why I created the memory chip was really to help me focus on what's really important. And, it, and, and I really always thought it was the checklist. And it really isn't. It's about the relationship. It's about being safe, happy, and pain-free for both of us. There are so many great was pieces of, of oh, my light went off. Whoops. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, uh, so many great pieces of information that you you just shared with us and I love this tool and uh, I love what you said you know um, looking for those moments of happiness and joy and and I think um, from our previous conversation do you have a, a great uh, explanation of of happiness in your mom and how it started to look different as she kind of uh, went through the disease uh, would you mind just speaking a little bit to that night I'm a uh, we have a picture of your mom, if you're okay with me sharing that with everyone. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. I'll get that pulled up here. So here. this is a story that I call uh, the difference between dignity and ego. And this is a picture of my myself, my mom, and then Barbara Lee Friedman, who's a musician. And I had two friends that said, we want to videotape your mom um, with moments of joy for you. You've given so much to the community. We want to give something back. And so we had scheduled an hour for them to, for Barbara Lee to come and sing and, and Nancy Chakran was going to videotape. And what happened during this time was my mom only lasted for a half an hour and there were times where she would fall asleep and then she would, she would get engaged again and she would kind of weave in and out. But it was, the videos are so powerful and they're on my YouTube channel and, and feel free to go see them. But what it really showed me was how joyful she is. Now you can look at this picture and say, you know, she's not looking real well cared for. She doesn't have a perm. She's got broken teeth. Her eyebrows are a little bushier. But as the disease progressed, those things weren't important to my mom. Prior to that, they were very important. She was very classy, always dressed nice, looked nice. But a lot of the grooming things became um, fearful for her. She didn't, she didn't know what a toothbrush was. You know, and so we went from a toothbrush to the swabs to, you know, the, the um, um, liquids that so we tried all different types of things. And then it got to the point of this isn't important. If it's going to wreck her day for half a day, what are we really doing? Are we trying to make ourselves, are we trying to prop them up and make them look good so we're comfortable? To me, no, that, that's a wrong approach. And that's something that has to change in the industry. We have to educate people more that even, you know, the perms, their hair changes and it might not hold or in the nursing home, you might get somebody you would got a perm and they just throw them in the shower and now it's, it's gone, <laughs> you know, um, not looking at those things, but instead, like with this picture, looking at the joyful moments, she's, you know, she has a smile, she has dimples. Um, when I look at this picture, you know, I see her squinty eyes, which is our family trademark, we're happy. Um, I, I hear her giggle and I actually shared this video with a, with a friend of my mom's who I would meet with every couple of months. 
And I was so excited. We were in this restaurant and the woman was probably about 76 years old. And I, I slid this DVD across the table and she screamed out at me in total disgust. Lori, I thought you were taking good care of her. She looks horrible. Why have you been lying to me all this time? Look at her. It doesn't even look like your mom. And I, you know, I got this nervous giggle and then I got these seething eyes looking at me. And then I realized in this moment that everything had changed. And I said to Kay, thank you. And she's like, thank you? What are you thanking me for? Gloria, I, I literally, she screamed in the restaurant, I'm disgusted with you. I can't believe you lied to me. And what I said to her was, thank you, Kay. I didn't realize. I don't see what you see anymore. I see the beauty in the joy of all of the nonverbal pieces. It's not about prompting somebody up to look good. It's about this, this pure essence. And to me, those are the things we hold with us. Those are the things that we're going to carry over. It's not going to be that she's got her makeup on and her cologne on and all of those things. It's those, it's those raw moments. That, that really penetrate and, and just embed in your body, heart, and soul that you'll never, ever forget. And it's so simple, but we have to flip a switch. We have to flip a switch and we have to be strong enough to stand up to others that want everything to look good, to be okay. Because by doing that, we're just hiding this disability and this disease even further. And we have to have these conversations. We have to have this understanding. We have to learn to walk graciously with it because there is no cure. There really isn't a prevention. And, and we, have to talk, we have to have these authentic conversations because how would you want to be treated? You know, that's a real simple question to ask yourself. What do you want if this would happen to you? Do you want to be accepted for who you are and and, you know, they become this, uh, this, this raw, authentic person because their filters are gone and they don't worry about the judgments and things that we have. And that's a beautiful space to be in. My mom, for example, I say was the safest place for me to go because she just accepted me. That's a gift. Wow, that story. Um, there's again so many good pieces of, of wisdom and information. And as you were you were talking through um, through that experience, that conversation with with your friend, what kept um, coming up with uh, coming up for me um, was that quote. I don't know who says it. Someone far smarter, smarter than me, but something to the effect of people won't remember what you did, but they'll remember how you made them feel. And I think that that kind of sums up that story so so perfectly. It's about how we're making our loved ones feel um, and how we feel uh, when we're with our loved ones. And, and so I think that that story is just really powerful. And, and for many, probably is the first time uh, they've heard, um, you know, about uh, caregiving and care being a care partner in from that perspective and and so hopefully uh, if you're out there and you're thinking you know your to-do list is miles long and you feel like you need to check all of that off that that maybe uh, you take a step back and, and think about it from a little bit different perspective and and you know how are you making your loved one feel that's so so important um, can I add to that? Um, because when you're talking about how we make them feel with dementia, a lot of times people will quiz who, who am I and you know, when did this happen and who was there? They don't always remember. And again, every person with dementia is different. Every care partner is different. Every environment is different. They don't always remember those details, but they will tell you if you ask that they remember how they felt. And so sometimes they will exhibit what we term behaviors because they're feeling uncomfortable, anxious, angry, and they can't put it into words. So it's our job to figure out what is triggering that because we all, I believe we all use the same equation for our reactions. And that is what is our current um, attitude? Um, and then what is, um, 
you know, how are, how are we feeling? And then what, what have we experienced in life? And those two things combine to create our perceptions and our perceptions trigger our reactions. And a person with dementia can't always back that out and tell you. So many times it's, it can be really simple things like somebody is cold or hot or hungry or has to go to the bathroom and, and they feel something, but they can't, they can't draw the line to it or they can't speak the words to tell us. And so we have to be extra conscious and what I call consciously care um, to really put that investigative hat on to, to help that process. Because so many times um, those things, those reactions can be changed to meet our standards more. Um, and again, think of, think of the term behavior as well. Do you like to be told you have a behavior? No, you're not told you have a behavior. You know, if you do something well, you're told it's a skill. And so, you know, how would you like to be told that you're having a behavior and you're having episodes or whatever the term is? You know, we have to, we have to change some of our verbiage and look at things differently and, and be respectful. And then many times we can ask a person with dementia, but we've been taught by many that, that they can't communicate. And so we don't even try. And a lot of times they can communicate even as the disease progresses. But again, you're looking for different cues. You're looking at their eyes. What are they saying? You're looking to see if their body is, is pointing in a direction or if they're holding something and trying to show you pain. So it's, it's about becoming more adept with our nonverbals, just like we are with small children. And we don't question doing it for a small child, mm -hmm. but for an adult, we, we're like, well, no, they should be able to tell us. Mm. And that's not always the case. So be as gracious with somebody with dementia as you would be with a young child. And that alone will change how you look at things. Thank you for that. that additional insight there, Lori. Um, I know that there's so many questions coming in that I definitely want to get to questions here now, if you're good with that. Um, sure. And I'm just going to touch on, Maria wrote in and asked, what is the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? So real quickly, um, just to make sure everybody knows, because that can be really confusing, uh, dementia is kind of the umbrella term that refers to cognitive impairment. And then there are different types of dementia and Alzheimer's disease is one type of dementia and it is the most common type of dementia. So that's, we'll sometimes use it interchangeably, uh, but when we use this term dementia, it might be Alzheimer's plus other types of dementia. So a few other types would be Lewy body dementia, frontal temporal dementia, vascular dementia. So uh, again, dementia is that kind of overarching umbrella term, and then there's different types of dementia that kind of fall underneath that umbrella. So Maria, I hope you find that helpful in kind of figuring out the difference between the two. Um, Alzheimer's, again, is a type of dementia, uh, but Alzheimer's is the most common. So just wanted to get that quick question out of the way. I'm sure others were sitting there asking the same thing. So thank you for, for writing in. Okay, so our first question comes from Jennifer. She's saying that she tries to make plans with her mom to attend memory cafes. She often cancels or say she has a stomach ache. Uh, it's hard to commit when they require attendance and then she doesn't decide she wants to go. So um, when we, they do go, she does have a really good time, um, but uh, she's wondering, you know, any tips on how she can get her to go or uh, let remind her of that uh, the fact that she'll really like it when she gets there. I think that that kind of applies probably to a lot of outings and situations um, where, you know, family members are trying to get their loved one to a doctor's appointment or uh, to engage socially. We know social engagement can be really important, especially in those earlier stages of dementia. Um, so any thoughts for Jennifer on that question, Lori? Oh, that is so common. And so one of the things, you know, that we learned to do was to not tell my mom up front because she didn't have a sense of time. And so she was worried she was going to be late all the time. Or, you know, why is she going? You're, you're going to this because something's wrong with me. And, you know, all of us want to help others. All of us want to feel purposeful. So maybe, maybe wait. If she's living in a community, maybe see if staff can have her have her ready without knowing that it is you know, that it is something that's going to happen. Go ahead and RSVP and then show up and go, Mom, I'm so excited to go. You need to come with me. This is going to be so much and make it a fun 
outing and have her go because she's supporting you. Um, many people with dementia will go. Um, even, even with memory cafes, it can be a lot of fun in the beginning. They will go to support the person who's caring for them. And so let them help you. Let them help you. And then it, it kind of molds into this, this fun thing where, where there's not as much resistance. And, um, and again, I know you can feel pressured when you have to RSVP. That's one of the reasons I know with our memory cafes, I said, we're not RSVP. You don't need that additional stress of, oh, I can't go because we didn't RSVP or feeling guilty that now you can't make it because they don't want to go. Um, so that, that would be my suggestion there is, is maybe not, not tell her ahead of time and then just come for an outing if they, if they like to go for an outing and then end up there. And, and maybe you go, maybe you stop someplace else and get an ice cream cone in the summer, you know, or something else that they like to do during that, uh, during that time as well. Thank you so much, Lori. Um, we have another question come in. Jennifer, we hope that that, that answer was, was helpful to you and, and everyone else listening who's trying to get their loved one um, to various activities. So, all right, so our next question um, comes um, from Moto. Moto, Moto. Um, I find that I'm angry a lot and I'm trying to figure out how to change this. Do you have anger issues? If so, what did you do? Or I guess, did you come across feelings of anger during your caregiving journey? Any advice for this, uh, this individual? Well, first of all, I have anger issues. I have them now. I had them before and I had them then. <laughs> you know, I had them today when I got mad, when my email I couldn't access and they changed my password on me. Um, we all have those. So understand that, that all emotions are normal and you shouldn't be embarrassed about them, they just are. And I think one of the worst things that we can do is not express them because then they bottle up and then they come out sideways. Mm -hmm. So what we do have to be careful for is that when we do express them, that we're not harmful to somebody else. And with caregiving, that can be tough. You know, like, like I said, with the memory chip, I didn't like how I snapped at my mom. You know, I got angry that she was repeating herself all the time, or maybe she didn't dress as quickly or get, you know, she was pushing my calendar back because we weren't, she couldn't move as fast as I wanted her to. Um, those things are normal. I, I remember having times where I literally, I would go down in my basement when no one was home. I'd shut all the doors and windows and I would scream and cry at the top of my lungs just to release it. And just releasing that is, is a healthy thing. And then you can sit back and go, okay, how do, how do I refocus? And for me, I found meditation and prayer really helped. For me, I found um, starting a gratitude book really helped. Starting my morning and my evening each day with what am I thankful for? And that might have to do with my loved one in my caregiving journey, or it might not. But sometimes we, we get way laid on what is good in our life, what is healthy, what do, what do we appreciate? And so by starting our day and closing our day off, for me, that gave me a lot of peace. That gave me a lot of peace. Um, the other thing that I did was I got really big into intentions, which I still, uh, still use. And I asked, I asked for help. Um, to my greater power. It doesn't make any difference, you know, who you believe in, but just knowing that you're not alone and admitting where you're lacking and, and not necessarily asking for specifics because I don't think we always know even what's available or what's possible, but just asking, you know, to be more gracious, to be more patient, to be more compassionate, to slow down, to be more present, you know, all of those things, to be more content in the role that I have. Um, and, and to help me find kind of, um, not to sound too new agey, the light and the comfort. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I think one of the biggest things that, well, two of the biggest things I learned was to breathe, um, which sounds kind of silly because we do that all the time, all day long, but we don't pay attention to it. But if you take, and I always say take 11 deep breaths, and on your inhale, ask for what you need. What are you missing? What are you lacking? What do you want? And on your exhale, 
release all the toxins in your mind, body, and soul, and just push them out. And just get rid of that anger, that negative thought, or that inner critic that's always snapping at us. That was really helpful. Um, and then, uh, uh, I guess my last revelation when it came to anger was I learned to reframe it. And I truly believe that we are here on this earth to learn. And so when I would get really angry, and when I still get really angry, I, I, you know, I believe in, in God and a higher spirit, and I call out and, t and I say, what is the lesson? <laughs> what is the lesson? There's got to be a reason you're putting me through this. And what was funny with that phrase was then I was focusing on things that could help me instead of spinning of the minutia of the anger or the frustration or whatever it was. I started looking for answers. My, my mind started reframing what I was seeing. And that, to this day, is probably one of the most powerful things, is to know that there is, there is something to learn by this experience. And then again, don't forget to share it with others. Thank you for that. As you were talking about breathing, I found myself taking a few deep breaths and I even feel more calm and relaxed. So uh, I, I often tell care, family caregivers, care partners about that tip a lot because even you breathing and taking a few deep breaths, if your loved one is agitated, sometimes they'll mimic that and they'll also calm down, which is to your point earlier, they kind of feed off of your energy and, and your emotions. So that's such a great tip and we hope that that's helpful to everyone. Um, we've had a couple questions um, come in around, um, you know, guilt, depression, those types of things. One specific guilt-related question uh, came from Sarah. She says, how do you deal with the guilt of not visiting your loved one in a facility as often as you feel you should be going? I hear that uh, kind of a question um, very frequently. So Lori, um, any thoughts for Sarah on that question? Well, you know, there's a saying that you have to take care of yourself first in order to really care for someone else well. And so not everybody, you know, it was as lucky as I was to have an opening for their mom two blocks from their house. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are the odds of that? Um, and, and, and so my brothers didn't go very often. And they didn't go, I, I think you have to understand what are the reasons you're not going for. So with my brothers, it was more about they didn't want to deal with the emotions and the loss. And with, um, with me, I, I, I visited a lot. And I still had guilt that I wasn't doing enough. I, I would sometimes be over there four times a day and, and on the phone. So I think it, it's all, you know, we all judged that differently. Um, but it's not, it's not an easy thing. And so, you know, I call that, that guilt, um, that kind of self-talk, my inner critic. And sometimes what I just say to my inner critic when I'm feeling really built, you know, beat up is, I heard you, don't go away. I'm doing the best I can with the knowledge I have and the resources I have. And if you can't give me something else to help, then go away. I, I, I'm, all, I, I'm already aware of that. I want to do better. We all want to do better. In life. No matter how good we're doing, we, there's always another bar to reach. So know, A, that you're not alone. This is a very common feeling. And again, I, I think it's something that we need to be able to talk about because when we bottle it up and we don't share it with others, it just eats away at us even more. And none of us should be ashamed of any of these emotions that we're having. They're real. They're a roller coaster. We all go through them. The person with dementia is going through them. And, and they're not going to stop throughout our life. So know that it is more common than not, especially in this fast-paced life. And, you know, just know that you're always sending love and, and not just to the person with dementia, um, but to yourself. And, and sometimes we need to get away and go to a movie or sleep for a day and not take a shower and just stay in our PJs because we, we just need quiet. We, we need to replenish. Um, for me, 
I had some great friends that would ask me to go to coffee every week. And I, and I said, no, 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 no. I have no time. I'm too busy. And one day I had a really, really bad day. And they called and said, can you go for coffee? And I was so arrogant. And I said, I will give you 10 minutes. Like I'm the queen, roll out the red carpet. You know, here I come, woo woo, Lori's coming. I mean, it was just the most asinine thing to say. But I showed up and I, and I said yes, not because I wanted to enjoy them, but I wanted to get them off my back because that was another thing that I had to fit in. That, that was how I entered coffee. I stayed for two hours. I, this wow. still makes me emotional. Mm-hmm. And we laughed and we cried together. But I walked out so filled. And I think when we give care, we get so depleted that we don't even know we're empty. So keep those relationships because it will make you a better person and you will be able to better care for your loved one with dementia and everyone else, including yourself. Don't, don't get as depleted as I did. And, and it's really easy to justify it and push it away and, and try to pretend it's not happening, but really embrace it and know that there are others if, if they're in your community or if it's through social media, you know, through groups like this, that people understand and they're there to lift you up because you will do the same for them because you get it. You almost had me in tears with that story. Uh, I think that just, um, we're going to show some resources here on the screen. Now we could keep taking questions all day, uh, but I know uh, we're getting close to about an hour. So um, I, you're right. Finding those outlets for, you know, respite or time away from the caregiving situation where you can uh, engage with those in your social circle or just get some time away for peace and quiet is so important uh, so that you can continue on in your caregiving journey because we see burnout. I know you see it in the caregivers that you and care partners that you encounter. I see it most certainly um, in the work I do. Caregivers are really at their wits end. Um, they're running a million miles an hour and uh, don't have, they don't feel like they have time to take a break, but that t- even two hour, one hour, 30 minutes of a break can really go a long way uh, in filling your bucket, uh, again, as um, the person providing care. So uh, thank you for sharing that and, and sharing all of your personal uh, experiences. It's, Uh, An honor to have you on again, uh, but an honor to have you share with us your journey because we can all, like you mentioned, learn from one another. So so before we wrap up today, um, I'm going to go through this slide of resources and then Lori has a couple slides of resources uh, as well. So uh, of course, alzheimerspeaks.com is Lori's uh, website. If you want more from Lori, uh, she has an awesome podcast. I subscribe to it and enjoy. uh, She has conversations kind of like this with a variety of experts and family caregivers, uh, people in the Alzheimer's and dementia space. So definitely check that out. Uh, Home Instead Senior Care, we also have a support and resource website called helpforalzheimersfamilies.com. A lot of the questions we've been getting in today, we have resources on there for you. uh, So please check that out. We also have a Facebook page. If you're joining us through Facebook Live, you're probably already um, you know, liking our page and following us, but if you're not, we encourage you to do that. Uh, there's also uh, confidence to care, caregiverstress.com, uh, all great caregiving, care partner related tips. Um, you know, if you are looking to get a little bit of respite, time away from the situation, or just a little extra support, we have services here at Home Instead that can help you. Um, if you can't afford uh, home care services, there is a dementia relief grant that you can apply for, um, and you can find that information at helpforalzheimersfamilies.com, and we'll type some of these resources into the comments on Facebook so you can link to them, and we'll send them out with the recording for those on Zoom. Um, and then uh, home in, uh, ALZ.org is the Alzheimer's Association's website, great information there. Um, and then there's the Memory Cafe directory, and Lori, somebody had actually typed in earlier and said, what is a memory cafe? We were talking about that earlier and not everyone knows what that is. So would you mind speaking to 
um, to that, that website uh, in particular and, and explaining what a memory cafe is. Well, first, I adore them because they're a different concept than a support group. And I saw somebody had written that, you know, my, my loved one doesn't want to go because they think they're going to tell them what to do. I, I describe it like this. A memory cafe is like a bowling league or a bridge club. You don't show up for the equipment. You show up for the camaraderie. You talk about all of life. And dementia comes in as a piece of that. Everything, every topic is safe. Um, everybody lifts everyone up. They bring resources. We laugh together. We cry. Sometimes we, we meet, my group meets twice a month for two hours. And I'm not kidding. Some days I leave and my cheeks are sore because we have laughed so much. And people at, at different stages can all be part, but it's for the person with dementia in their care partner. Because so often family and friends kind of leave them on the wayside. And, and so this is a new support group of like-minded people that uh, it's just the, the relationships and bonds that are built so quickly are amazing. And I've got a video um, or I've got a few videos on memory cafes that will talk, talk with that and kind of give you a little slice of, of what people feel. Many say that it, it, it fills their soul, you know, it refuels them. And, um, and we get our, our dementia, um, members and they're doing one-liners back and forth they keep us in stitches sometimes so um, everyone is different but you can go to memorycafedirectory.com and um, they have uh, the best list and the easiest access to be able to find if there's one in your area and I'm always open to talking with people and and mentoring if they're interested in starting one as well. Wonderful. Thank you. The next website on here is usagainstalzheimers.org. They're a great partner of ours at Home Instead. Uh, they have some great resources. Lori, anything you want to add on that website? They're just fantastic. They too have um, some live calls with researchers and people living with dementia. Um, they have a newsletter that is fabulous. You can get it on a daily basis and it won't overwhelm you. It's just no, short snippets. And if you want to dig deeper, but it's a, it's a great way to find out what's going on in legislation, what's going on in research, and then just tips and all of their different groups from clergy and veterans and women and um, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's fabulous. You won't be disappointed by, by the information you find there. Plus they have the A-list, which does um, surveys that you can just take online that are really short and sweet. And what I love is they get back to you on what the heck happened with that survey, um, which is really nice too. Yeah. And I know that they're working to use those surveys to further research so it's a really easy way to engage in research. I love the A-list. I think it's a great concept. So yeah, definitely check out their website. And then Lori, those last two websites, um, do you want to touch on those briefly? Sure. Um, the Alzheimer's Weekly has great updates too. And they have things from articles and videos, but it, it's just a nice uh, wide resource, a nice wide net. I think that is just, it's all about giving hope. Um, the Women's Alzheimer's Movement is through Maria Shriver, and she is such a, a great advocate. Um, she's doing a ton with research and, you know, her media presence. Um, she's always pushing things out there. Um, so lots of good things. She does a thing called um, Move for Minds, which will be happening this year in the fall. And with those, they, they have live events where they do kind of some exercise, they do some talks, and then they have um, some vendors and things there. Um, but it, I just can't say enough good things. She's just so authentic. And, you know, her dad had, had dementia, and she is just out to make a difference and help us all. Yes, yeah, she's a great advocate and definitely is bringing this um, topic uh, and this disease to the forefront uh, of media and um, you know, just raising awareness across across the globe, uh, and especially here in the United States. So check those out. And then Lori has a whole list here of, of resources um, for you to check out. Are there a couple on here that stand out in particular, Lori, that you want to call out? Um, yes. I think we've got dementia chats on here, like the third or fourth one down. Those are recordings I do, and my panelists all have dementia. So I noticed some comments of, you know, my loved one has dementia, but it, we can't talk about it. We have one on denial. And people with dementia say how to approach. 
Um, and sometimes just watching these videos change their perceptions because their perceptions many times are negative, like many of ours are, that a person can't communicate. And, and by watching those things change a ton, but we, we cover all kinds of topics. Uh, there's one there of how they want us to care and support their care partners because they worry about that. Um, we, we touch base on the radio show, everyone is welcome. I interview people all over the world. So people living with dementia, families have stories. We've had Harvard research and, and many research projects on um, all kinds of businesses. We've had musicians, movie directors. I believe everyone's voice is important and needs to be heard. And so Alzheimer Speaks Radio is a way to be able to make those connections. And those are all, you know, free and online. And if you have a story you'd like to share, you know, please reach out to me for that. Um, dementia friendly, uh, becoming dementia friendly, I think is, is really important. I was involved with um, developing the first dementia friendly community here in the U.S. in Watertown, Wisconsin. And it doesn't have to be big and complicated. It's just getting liked mind people with passion and starting. You know, it's not about perfection. It's just about making progress every day. And so if you're interested in getting a group like that started, please reach out to me. The Purple Angel Project is a, is a graphic developed by a man with dementia, Norms McNamara, that has gone globally. And the whole purpose of the graphic is just for people to use it and others to ask, what is it? because it's a non-threatening way to open the door to have a conversation. And we cannot make any change without having comfortable, honest conversations. So I guess those are, um, so last would be the resource directory. Um, you can, uh, there's a, a company called Provalens and they've developed something called Care to Plan. And if you go to my website, there's a big uh, directory button. You can, you can get some basics. It's kind of in a beta test right now, but you'll, you'll get a feel for that. And I'd love to share more with you on that. And then there are a few more downloadable dementia resources that we have here, and we'll send those out in the follow-up information. We're, we're really coming down to the end of the hour here, which makes me sad because I could talk to you all day, Lori, about these questions and, and about the work you're doing. You're just doing so many fantastic things um, in the Alzheimer's space and supporting those living with the disease and those caring for them. And I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for for joining us today, for sharing your story, and, and for all the work that you do. And I hope that if you're listening, you go out and check uh, out Lori's website, you follow her podcasts or watch her, her videos. They're so informational. I've learned so much from her in this hour and in following her uh, on her various channels. So Lori, thank you so much uh, again for joining us today. It's been a true pleasure. Well, thank you. This is this has been fun. Uh, this is what I adore doing is just having these conversations, and when we can learn so much from one another, it's it's just uh, it's just an incredible journey and an honor. So, thank you. Well, the honor is truly ours, uh, and we're honored that all of you have tuned in today, whether it's been on Facebook Live or it's been through the Zoom platform. We so appreciate that you've joined us for our caregiver chats. Uh, again, today we talked about, um, you know, the challenges of caregiving, but overcoming them and finding hope and resources uh, that are out there to help support you and, and um, walk alongside you through this journey. And I hope that you'll join us next month. We host these caregiver chats every month with various experts, people living with dementia. Um, but next month, we're actually going to focus on uh, kid caregiving. We have a uh, brilliant, I think she might be 12 now. When I met her, she was 11, 11 year old who has a website called kidcaregivers.com. And her name is Haley. Her and her mom are going to join us to talk about how kids can be involved uh, in caring for their loved one with Alzheimer's or dementia. And that will be July 23rd at 1 p.m. And I'll just, I have a little slide here. I'll, I'll share that with you all quickly. Um, again, July 23rd at 1 p.m. We'll be sending out information on our Facebook page and through our email list. So I hope that you'll tune in for that live chat. Um, and if you have um, any uh, questions, please feel free to comment them in um, or follow up with us via email. Um, at our live chat at homeinstead.com. Again, thank you for joining us. We wish you all a wonderful day and a great rest of your weekend. Take care. We'll see you next time.
Bye. Bye-bye.